Hello and welcome to today's edition of Echo at Africa. Now here's what we have coming up for you. We will be talking about the Zambian forest that is depleting and what they're doing to restore it. We present a new way of saving energy. They are called organic light emitting diodes or OLED and they are about to take over from traditional lighting. Then we will reveal how and why Namibian rangers are restoring original elephant migration routes. Yes, every day we talk about waste, biological waste, degradable waste, non-degradable waste, even plastic or chemical waste as the case may be, but very few times do we talk about waste from farming or from cash cropping. Hmm. In particular, let's look at cassava. Nigeria is recorded to have produced about 50 metric tons of cassava some time back. A third of that turns out to be waste. And in the rural areas, all they do with this waste is take a portion of it to feed the animals. The rest is thrown away. But the researchers are thinking, what can we do with cassava waste? And beyond just doing the things we do, what else can we do? Let's see this report. The Temidira Gari Processing Cooperation in the Nigerian village of Ajegunla is all about cassava. Over 100 people work here from dusk till dawn, most of them women. They produce several tons of ground and dried cassava powder called gari. Salahuddin Ibagun is the co-op's chairman. He's been in the business for over 40 years. He's always thought of cassava peels as just waste until recently. We throw the peels away. Some people come and pick them up to use as fodder for their livestock. Sometimes they pay us. If we can't find any takers, we just throw them away. Usually, gari production generates large amounts of waste. Normally, after the roots are harvested, the plant's leaves and stems are thrown away. The peels can make up as much as 15% of the root, and they're discarded as well. With Nigeria producing over 54 million tons of cassava annually, the amount of waste is enormous. It isn't easy to dry the peels, especially in the rainy season, so only a small part is used as animal fodder. Most cassava farmers and processors leave them in heaps to rot or burn them, which pollutes the air, soil and groundwater. Now, scientists like Ihanacho Okika from the International Livestock Research Institute are looking for a way to make the peels into something useful. He says they can be turned into feed for livestock and contribute to the farmer's income. The process involves arrival of the fresh peels, uh, sorting out uh, stumps that could damage uh, the, the drum if used. Mm -hmm. And then once they are sorted, we go into rasping. We rasp the, the, the peels to a consistency that enables a, a pressing of water out. And that process is really key to mm -hmm. what we are doing. After pressing the water out, the rasp is dried and turned into a cake. Then it's pulverized and dried again. Finally, the granule is sorted. To cut down on dust, the powder is pressed into pellets of various sizes. They can be used to feed poultry, fish, pigs, goats, cattle and sheep. Critics worry that using these peels as fodder may have negative effects on livestock but researchers believe it's a win-win situation for both the cassava producers and the environment. And with livestock production expected to grow more in the coming decades, processing peels could even become a billion euro business, a way to convert waste to wealth. Trash packaged and ready for removal, either for disposing or for recycling. Let's talk about trash, for instance. Plastic constitutes about 11% of solid waste in the Middle East and North Africa. And out on the streets, you see it everywhere. But a project called Reform Studio is living up to the age-old adage, one man's trash is another man's treasure. 25-year-old entrepreneurs Miriam Hazim and Hend Riyad are using plastic bags for weaving. By doing so, the two are fusing tradition and modernity. Now let's see how they are doing their bit in Egypt's capital, Cairo.
Did you know plastic bags can be turned into designer chairs? Weaving is a craft that goes back to the time of the Egyptian pharaohs. Today, a design studio in Egypt is reviving that weaving tradition and fusing it with the upcycling trend. Plastic bags are woven to produce colorful fabric for chairs and benches. It takes between 50 and 150 plastic bags to manufacture one chair. Plastic makes up 11% of solid waste in North Africa, so this is a great contribution to a cleaner environment and stylish homes. We like that. If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or contact us on Twitter. Hashtag doing your bit. We'll share your stories. We're presently standing in Lufasi Park, highlighting one man's effort at restoring vegetal cover when he discovered that the vegetal cover was depleting owing to the activities of men. But let's go on to Zambia, the largest dry forest in the world, that the Mimbio forest in Zambia. But guess what? It's shrinking. Every year, an area the size of Northern Ireland is chopped down. Zambia is hoping to receive money from the REDD, an international fund, to help stop the deforestation. But to do that, they must document the forest resources. We follow the team of rangers and botanists who are tracking how the forest is changing and working with communities on how to use its resources more sustainably. For the past three weeks, they've been on the move through the forest. Within a radius of 20 meters, the rangers measure the entire stock of trees and catalog the different species. But the rangers don't need to climb up to measure tree height. They use the clinometer and tangent method. The more biomass and carbon storing capacities a country's forests have, the more money they can get from international climate funds. The Miambo forest is the world's largest dry forest area. But for years, it's been shrinking. And along with it, it's biodiversity as demand for firewood and farmland grows. Due to population increase, there is certainly a possibility that some of the clusters will be harvested in the nearest future. And that is an indicator showing that there is some possible change on land use that is taking place in these areas. On their way to the next survey area, the rangers can see firsthand how drastically the forest is changing. New farmland is springing up in areas that were previously forest land. Years of monoculture planting has destroyed existing agricultural land and harvests. Abel Siampale explains to residents how they can farm more sustainably, for example, by planting fields with different crops. Stopping the swift pace of deforestation is also Noah Zimba's goal. Zimba is a professor of botany and he advises the Zambian government on environment protection. Today he's with his students on an excursion to an aloe plantation. They're learning what alternative sources of income the Miombo forest offers. I'm cutting the blade of an aloe and if you leave, you can see it's, it's dripping, yeah? And this is what is very useful. The, the one that appears orangish is the one that normally used for creams. One liter of leaf sap can bring around 220 euros. Noah Zimba is convinced that the forest can be saved if people have alternative sources of livelihood. Just the understanding that you can move an ordinary product like this to give you high value returns, mm -hmm. that connection requires some just bit of appreciating that reality. Yeah, but most people think that, okay, it's just a plant that grows everywhere. So what is it for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a common, common plant of the Miombo system. So nobody really pays attention to it. By sundown, the rangers have managed to cover another four of the 170 survey zones here. 
At the camp, Abel Siampali meets the other two teams involved in the forest inventory. They sit down for their first warm meal of the day. The rangers plan to be finished with their inventory by the end of the month. That's when they'll find out exactly what is left of the Miyambo forest. To Germany now, where the green energy transition is gaining momentum. A closing down of power plants and the emergence of new technologies is meeting with the approval among the population. Such as across the nation are incorporating green power into their lives as a matter of course. In Berlin, the public transport agency has even embraced solar energy for its ferries, which transport people across the waterways that form a major part of the urban landscape. Just a two-minute ride, and the passengers of the F-12 ferry line have reached their destination on the other side of Berlin's Dama River. But this is not just any ferry. It is one of four solar-powered ferries run by Berlin's public transport agency. Captain Anna Sadowski has been piloting solar ferries for two years. The solar ferry is the first solar-powered boat that I've captained. But the difference is not really noticeable when driving. In terms of handling, the boats are great. One is just electric and one diesel. And gone is the noisy motor and smell of diesel. Berlin's transport agency has been running the solar ferries over short distances since 2014. They are purpose-built and all four ferries cost around 3 million euros in total. A steep investment, but the returns are clean energy and fuel savings. It'll take a full 10 years to pay for itself. The ferry is run with the battery, so battery powered, and this battery is directly charged by the solar cells. But there is not always enough sunshine in Berlin for the boats to be fully solar powered. We use the onshore connection so we can start the next day with a full battery. Still, whether in rain or shine, the F-12 ferry is always in service. And the passengers are happy with the solar ferries. Solar ferries are definitely a good thing. I think it's great that this is here, and it's good that it'll be expanded. We've just really learnt that, yeah. and um, we think it's awesome. fantastic. Yeah, that's great. It's, it's nice Renewable and... energy, it's just so cool. Despite the success of the project, the transport agency could not say whether it was planning to put more solar-powered ferries into service. But Captain Sadowski has been won over. The ferries run really well, I'm convinced. Whether in Berlin or in other parts of Germany, solar ferries are becoming increasingly popular for powering transport across the country. And sometimes the boats themselves are even an attraction for visitors. You know, it's not every day you get to see yourself while you're doing the job. Now, I'm seeing myself and I'm quite excited, but you, on the other hand, may be familiar with the displays of blazing colors that make up the modern thin television screens. They are made possible by OLED technology. These are organic light emitting diodes, which as well as providing deep rich colors also use less energy than LEDs. A German French project is at the cutting edge of this promising high tech market. The two companies have been nominated for the German French Academy Awards. Let's take a look at this illuminating cross border cooperation. The south of France is famous for its very special light. And light of a different sort is an important business here. Round OLEDs are the standard design produced here at Astrom Fiam in Toulon. The OLED lamps are made by hand and they come with the Made in France label often associated with luxury goods. The company founder takes us to see the nerve center at the heart of this Franco-German project, the clean room. This is where the OLEDs are manufactured. A chemical vapor coating is applied to glass or plastic. The materials come from Germany, supplied by Astrofiom's partner company, Norvaled. The Germans supply the materials exactly as they are needed. 
We work with our partner Novaled on various molecules, working out what the dosage needs to be, how many nanometers of which molecules need to be layered on top of each other to manufacture a particular OLED. Last week, this bottle came from Germany. It alone costs 20,000 euros. And this is where it came from, the city of Dresden in eastern Germany. Here, Novaled is testing the chemical function of OLED light, which stands for organic LED. The company claims that OLED lights are environmentally friendly, as they do not contain mercury or other harmful materials. Also, the layer of chemicals applied are very thin, just one fiftieth of a hair. Omran Fadel joined Novaled eight years ago. When I was writing my PhD, there weren't many jobs available in France. All the important companies in this area who would employ people with a doctorate in chemistry were in Germany. So I came here. Novaled employs 140 people. Their service is needed to produce OLED lights for lighting systems, but also TV and smartphone displays. One day, OLEDs will light up our world in a completely different way. They could be stuck to the windows, for example. In the day, they'd be transparent. At night, they'd then light up. These are the kinds of things we're working on, particularly with the white light. We want to revolutionize lighting. Back in France, 30 employees are busy making large-scale lights designed for palaces, railway stations or major stores. The Franco-German project has been going since 2007. We are two small companies and we both have our own cultures. The development of the chemicals in Germany and the production of the lamps and elegant luxury lamps here in France. And we've managed to bring these two different cultures together. Whether it's a designer lamp for a couple of thousand euros, TVs or a smartphone display, OLED lights are spreading quickly. And now it's back to nature. Behind me are horses that have been rescued from different environments and situations. But let's leave them for now and talk about elephants who for obvious reasons need lots of space and often cross borders and populated areas when migrating. But their instincts to roam at will is frequently thwarted by fences, roads and settlements blocking their way. So a couple of years ago, five African states established one of the world's largest conservation areas. Our team traveled to northeastern Namibia to the Capri Strip to join rangers there. Their aim is to restore the elephant's original migration routes by simultaneously offering incentives to local people. In northeastern Namibia, most people live from farming. Raymond Kitumbeka grows corn, like many farmers here in the region. But he has a constant job on his hands, protecting his crops from hungry neighbours. There were seven elephants. As soon as we heard them, we ran out to drive them away. But the elephants aren't afraid of us, so they just stay put. They destroyed the fields and suddenly our livelihood was gone. We fear for our lives. But elephants and people do largely get along here. Conservationists and local authorities have set up protected corridors, allowing the elephants to roam along age-old routes. These trails are patrolled regularly to preempt possible problems, such as elephants crossing busy roads. Yeah, we are standing on a migratory route uh, that is coming from Botswana uh, to Angola, to Zambia and Angola. Unfortunately, it passes the trans Zambezi Highway, where it could be danger to wildlife such as elephant and also people. The project is part of the Kavanga Zambezi Park. It covers territory in Botswana, Namibia, Zambia, Angola and Zimbabwe. The park is successful because the local people profit from the elephants. They have even set up conservation areas outside the park so they can earn money 
as we hear from Chief Joseph Mayuni, the community leader. Protecting the elephants has created jobs for the young people in our community. We also get a good income from tourism, from lodges and campsites. Then we also have trophy hunting in our area. Hunting firms get licenses, which also bring us a lot of money. Hunting and tourism provide the main sources of income. Lodge owner Johann Marx says that means local people really value the animals. Over a long period of time, they can receive financial benefit from the animals instead of poaching them. As a result, the elephants are free to roam almost as they please, even if that does mean crossing the odd road or other man-made obstacles. All right, so we're still in the business of gathering waste for disposal or recycling, as the case may be. But we will leave it with a report from our correspondent in Kenya, and it has to do with the plastic waste challenge. About 24 million bags are used in Kenya every month. In particular, in villages like Watamatu on the coast, it's a major challenge. There are a growing population and the lack of waste management facilities is going to result in pollution both on land and sea. It also affects tourism, a major source of income. A local initiative called the Watamatu Marine Association is trying to keep the beaches clean and recycling the plastic waste. But that initiative is also creating jobs at the same time. Let's see how they're doing it. Every Monday, Jeffrey Baluzzi, age 26, combs the beach as part of a cleanup crew from the Watamo Marine Association. Each time, they pick up about four big sacks of plastic waste. They're paid the equivalent of four euros a day. That means they earn 16 euros a month. That's not very much, but they're all happy to do this work. Jeffrey has been part of the crew since its inception. My main intention was just to change the environment itself because since the environment was different here, there was a lot of taka taka and this was dangerous even to the sea creatures. So that's what brought me here. But they bring the trash to a recycling center run by the organization, not far from the beach. Shakushi Lewa helps sort the trash. He lives on the grounds of the recycling center. They separate hard and soft plastic. Part of it is given to local artists and women's associations, which make flip-flop sandals or window screens to stop insects from getting into houses. The hard plastic is the organization's cash cow. It brings in the equivalent of 7,000 euros a year. The recycling center has acquired a new shredder. Soon it will be able to handle plastic not just from all of Watamu, but from another nearby community. Jeffrey thinks they'll be able to shred about 20,000 kilos of hard plastic, more than double their present capacity. So I can say this project has been so benef beneficial on me and the project itself, because up to date, the takataka -taka we used to have on the beach are now reduced. On the village, the same. Thanks to the initiative, around 25 people in Watamu are earning steady money. Shikushu was unemployed for a long time until the project hired him. He lives for free on the grounds of the recycling center. He mixes old paper, water and wood chips to make briquettes for burning. The business idea earns him the equivalent of 100 euros a month from garbage. Oh, community, come a village. When the people from the community collect those plastics and bring them here, they get money for the plastic. Jeffrey says the biggest challenge is to make clear to the community that recycling plastic is much more than just a short-term money-making project. The challenge we do have is that, because people say, OK, I can join with you working there, but what are you going to give me? You know. So you have to pay him. Instead of volunteering, they don't volunteer. And they do have to volunteer, because this, this is our, their country. The environment belongs to them, too. The Watamu environmental activists want to do more to educate the community. 
Jeffrey wants to make people understand that recycling garbage is meaningful. It looks like he's already come a long way. Now, if all of us, being human, would understand better how important it is to manage our waste, then we'll be adding to the health of the environment, plus we'll live better and healthier lives. That's it on the show today. I want to thank you for being a part of it. For more on our coverage on the environment and other issues, check out our website. Join the conversations as well on our social media platforms. They're all still on your screen. So we'll bring you another edition of the show. It's bye-bye from the Farsi Park in Lagos, Nigeria.